Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, how we thank you for this, another chance to be able to come into this place of worship. God, we thank you for touching us with your finger of love, starting us on our way, blessing us one more time with brand new mercies. God, we thank you for you looked beyond our faults, supplied us with our needs, and gave us one more chance to be in the house one more time. Now, God, we pray, first of all, that you would forgive us, for we have sinned and fallen short of your glory. God, we pray right now that you would consecrate our hearts and our minds, God, that we can be able to receive something from you on today that may equip us, that may strengthen us, that may lead us, that we may know and understand, God, that you are still standing by. Father, bless everyone that's here, those that may be on their way, those that are watching online. Father, we just want your anointing, your power, your spirit to fall fresh in this place this morning, God, that we can feel your presence, that our service can be felt by you, God, that we can say, surely our hearts burn with him. But we know we was in the presence of the almighty God. Now move upon us that we may be able to have a worship experience from on high. Have thine own way like only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. I'm excited about this another Sunday. Anytime you get to go into the house of the Lord and tell God how good he's been to you, it's a wonderful occasion because I don't know about you, God is good. Say it one more time. God is good. Amen. Amen. I know, I know, I get it, I understand. I am right there with you. Uh, we're still getting over yesterday in the homegoing celebration of our past emeritus. But what I know, I keep telling y'all what I know in my heart and in my mind and in my soul. He loved to have church. Sunday, just like me, was the best day of the week. It's the best day of the week, and I am excited about this. Another chance to be able to tell God thank you, for he has been good to me. And I know just by looking out at some of you, he's been good to you. Amen. Amen. All right, listen, we're going to keep climbing higher, keep going. Y'all continue to pray. Our choir's going to come. They're going to take us higher. Listen, y'all kick off y'all shoes. Y'all stand to y'all feet. If you know the song, sing loud. Let's have church. Amen. Amen.
of God. He is an awesome God. Great and mighty is his name. Great and mighty is his name. Have you had to call on his name? And if you had to call on his name, did he answer your call? And because he answered your call, guess what? You ought to be able to say great and mighty is his name. There's no other name that I can call on that's going to step in when I need him most. Who's reliable, who's faithful, who's love that he has. Great and mighty. Lord have mercy. He is an awesome God.
so that we can take a look at what's going on. We want to be an encouragement to you. We want to be a help to our youth and make sure that they are going in the way they need to go because we understand that this world we live in, amen, it takes a village to make sure that we are training up a child in the way that they should go. So um, we'll set, a, uh, set aside a time on Sunday for y'all to bring those. So parents, make sure they don't be trying to hide them from you. Amen. Y'all make sure they get here on that Sunday that I, that I select. Uh, also, uh, for all of our new members, for all of our baptism candidates and what have you, uh, very soon, next month, very soon, next month, I will uh, solidify the exact date. Uh, we want we want to have a new members orientation uh, uh, day. Amen. Amen. It's going to be on a Saturday. Uh, we're going to have some little continental breakfast and whatnot, and we just want to go over obviously the plan of salvation and some other things, uh, so you can know. The church that you joined. Amen. 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 We want to educate you. We want to let you know our philosophies and what we stand for and the things that we strive to do. And this is not just open to our new members, but we know that there are some there are some old members that want to come and sit in and see what's happening. You are more than welcome. Amen. Amen. So we want to share. So you'll know the church that you joined. You just want to don't want to just show up on Sunday and say, I go here. Amen. We want to know where you go, what we stand for. So when somebody asks you, what y'all got going over there? You can tell them. He says, I don't know, I just go on Sundays. No, we want you to be able to stand firm and say, listen, our church, we, we ministry driven. We like to reach out to the community. We want to touch our youth. We, yeah, so we're going to uh, dive into that on, on through new members orientation. And we're going to give you certificates at the end so you'll know, hey, I, I'm a member proud member of the historic Grand of Bethel Missionary Baptist Church. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, I have a uh, thank you card that I need to read. Uh, it says, thank you. Whether uh, it was a card, <laughs> whether it was a card, prayer, or act of service, your kindness is greatly appreciated. Thank you for being there for us during our time of loss. We don't take any of that for granted. God bless the Magnina family. Amen. 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 Yes, we, the love that has been shown from this great church over the last week and a half, two weeks, and the passing of our pastor emeritus. Listen, we can't say thank you enough for the members and friends here of the Greater of the Church. We love all of you. And we're thankful unto God for the love that y'all have shown us. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I'm excited. We got some guests in the house, y'all. They ain't really guests. Uh, we, we know them very well. Uh, Pastor McNeely, T.L. McNeely, and the Bread of Life Church family. Amen. They are here worshiping with us, and we're excited to have you here in the house. Uh, I ain't going to say welcome and all that. Hey, y'all. Good to see y'all. Amen. Y'all at home, and it's good to see y'all. Uh, there was one other thing, and I'm trying to remember. Men, that's it, men, men. Uh, we are rapidly approaching our next uh, men's meeting. Uh, I'll be getting information out to you guys on uh, the book, the portion of the book we want to read over so we can discuss it when we come on that particular Saturday. Listen, I told y'all, we had a good time when we met uh, last month, or this month, what is this one? Yeah, this one, they, they run together. Uh, but we had a great time, and I'm looking forward to the next time uh, so that we meet and we are going to continue to have a good time uh, fellowshipping one with another. Now, this is not just open to all the, all the old brothers. This is men. So 
So young men, and all are welcome just the same. Amen. Amen. So parents, if y'all want to have these, I'm going to stop at about the age of, uh, Braylon, how old are you? 17. All right. I'm going to stop at 16. I'm going to stop at 16. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to stop at 16. I know there's probably some younger ones that can use some of what we got to say, but I'm going to stop at 16. Uh, so if you're 16 or older, uh, y'all are more than welcome to be here with us as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, I think that's about it. Good, All right. Listen, choir, Lord have mercy. Y'all came to sing this morning. Y'all came to bless us this morning. So listen, I'm going to get on out the way so y'all can keep taking us higher. And then after them, we will hear what thus says the Lord. Amen? Amen.
Samuel took a stone and named that place Ebenezer. Have you heard that word before? Ebenezer. Some of us have heard that word over and over and over again. And there may be somebody who just may be hearing it for the first time today. Listen, some of us have known what it uh, has meant for many years. Others are still wondering what in the world does that word mean? Ebenezer, Ebenezer. It, it needs to be actually a part of your easy ecclesiastical lexicon. I know, I know. I know. That's nothing, nothing more than just your church words. That's what it needs to be a part of your church words. It needs to be a part of your vocabulary when you come to church. Ebenezer. Ebenezer. Let the church say Ebenezer. Ebenezer. Some of us have heard that word before, others have not. Some of us can remember that that's the name of that church in Atlanta where Dr. Martin Luther King Sr first pastor. Then Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. served as pastor. And now the Reverend Dr. Senator Raphael Warnock serves as the pastor there. Listen, Ebenezer is a strong church word. It literally means a stone of help. That, that's what Ebenezer means. A stone of of help. And, and Samuel in the scripture says he raised up a stone and that stone he named Ebenezer and then put it into commentary to caption. He says thus far the Lord has helped us. Yeah. Listen, you, you've got to understand that this is a beautiful picture of what God is able to do. This declaration, this proclamation that Samuel makes in verse 12 comes after a series of, listen, listen, of unfortunate events. That there, there have been many things that have happened throughout the book of 1 Samuel that sometimes uh, have disillusioned the people of God known as the children of Israel. That they have had to deal with and as a consequence of defeat, they're dealing with disillusionment or depression. They are dealing with a circumstance that is beyond their control. That they're dealing with the reality that the people of God, the apple of God's eye, the chosen ones of God have experienced defeat. Listen, I don't know if there's anyone in the church today who knows that you are the chosen one of God. You are a child of the living God, but, but you will admit on today that you had some defeats in your life. You've had some moments where you thought you were going to be the victor, but you ended up being the loser. You, you thought for sure you were going to be the one who would rise above the challenge, but the challenge seemingly got the better of you. And I know, and I know you don't like to always admit that. People don't like to always, because we like to celebrate all the things when things go our way. But when circumstances are in our favor, we want to throw up our hands and say, look at us. But today, you got to walk through the story of the children of Israel. Because I submit today that sometimes our defeat sets us up for a bigger victory. I submit that sometimes circumstances of life that are unfavorable sets us up for something that is so much more favorable than our minds can even conceive of. And that's what happens with these children of Israel as they meet Samuel upon a place called Mizpah. And when Samuel gets up there, he takes up this stone in his hand. And when he takes the stone in his hand, he names it Ebenezer. And he says, thus far, the Lord has helped us. And listen, every one of us, truth be told, every one of us have had a thus far testimony at some point in our lives. Every one of us have had a thus far proclamation at some point in our lives. And I want us to look 
at the story of the children of Israel on this Sunday morning to see just how God brought them through their defeat so that they can experience a greater victory. But by the time we get to this place called Mizpah, while they were up on this mountain, they can now celebrate that God has helped them get through what they lived through so that they could get to the place to where they are right now. Mizpah, Mizpah, it is it's a spot where they worshiped the Lord and honored the Lord for what the Lord had done. And it is there that their leader, their spokesman, their prophet and judge, Samuel, Holds up this stone, says, Thus far, the Lord has helped us. Now, now you've got to understand the context if you're going to appreciate the content. Amen. You, 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 you need to understand the context. So, in order to understand the context, you have to go back to chapter one. Because it is there in chapters one, two, and three that we get to know who Samuel is firsthand. It is there we find out that he has a miraculous birth. And God calls him at a young age, and God chooses to use him to do great exploits in the world. Listen, you've got to understand that God does not have to wait until you in your 80s and 90s to use you. God doesn't have to wait until you your 40s, 50s, and 60s to use you. God can choose to use you from your young years so that the world might know that God is no respecter of persons. So God chooses Samuel, who had a miraculous birth and is now living a life that is sold out to God. And, and listen, again, you don't have to wait till you 40, 50, 60, 70 years old to get sold out to God. Listen, oh, come on now. This, I, I got anybody here in their 20s who can say, I sure do love the Lord. All right. I see your hands going up. Amen. You ought to be a few folk in your 30s. Who can testify I love them with my whole heart. There are some people in the church today who can testify that God will favor you. He will prosper you. God will show you his love and kindness towards you even in the young seasons of your life. And that's what Samuel finds out. By the time we get to 1 Samuel chapter 4, 5, and 6, we find out that the Israelite people or having a rough time. And then they've got some enemies. And those enemies are called the Philistines. The Philistines, these individuals are doing everything they can to wreak havoc on the lives of the people of God. And, and there are some people, it seems, doesn't it, that who are just deputized to wreak havoc in your life. And then there's some people, you think that, yeah, that that must be your sole purpose to make my life miserable. And that's what the Philistines do. They do everything that they can to give the Israelites a hard time. And now they have defeated them so badly that what they do in chapter 4 is not just defeat them, but they add insult to injury by taking from them the ark of the covenant. Yeah. The Ark of the Covenant. Now, some of you may have heard that phrase before, but I want to make sure that those who haven't understand just how significant the Ark of the Covenant is. Well, when you read through scripture from Genesis to the book of Malachi, you'll find out that the Ark of the Covenant is a significant situation. It is a significant symbol in the lives of the Israelites. The Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant of God, or the Ark of the Lord, or however they phrased it. These words, these phrases are, are used repeatedly. It, it's, it's constantly used in the scriptures to show us that God chose to reveal himself, manifest himself, his presence among his people with this box. It, it seemingly was a simple box, and it may have some ornaments on it or whatever, but however, it was a box that the Israelites carried around with them. It was a box that symbolized the presence of the Lord in their midst. Now, now, now you got to catch this. Now, this is significant because whenever they have the Ark of the Covenant with them, and whenever they're doing what God has chosen them to do, 
they experience victory after victory after victory. As long as they was doing what God told them to do. Because you know that when you get in the presence of God, you and God always equal the majority. That they're having a great time with the presence of God. But, 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 but then they begin to displease God. They begin to dishonor God. And that's how they experience defeat. They're, they're now dealing with defeat at the hands of the Philistines. And the Philistines take from them the Ark of the Covenant. Now, hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, you, you, you're not supposed to take, take that. That, that that's, that's visible manifestation of the presence of God from them, that from, from the midst of the people of God, but that's what they do to add insult to injury. They kick them while they were down and said, we're going to take the ark with us. And now from chapters 4 to chapter 6, they have to deal with the reality that the ark is no longer in their midst. And this is disheartening. This is disillusion. This is depressing. Because they're accustomed to having the ark with them. And now when they when they have the ark, they knew, hey, when we had the ark with us, we experienced all kinds of victory. But because they displeased God. They have been defeated by their enemies. And now the enemy have taken the ark. But, but, but here's the good news. God don't play when it comes to his presence. And now when you read chapters 4, 5, and 6, you'll find out it's the Philistines who have taken the ark from the Israelites. And now they're experiencing havoc in their lives. Because they took what didn't belong to them. God said, listen, I don't play with my presence. I don't play when you start messing with my people. That they, they, they have taken the ark. And now when you read chapter 4, you'll find out the Philistines are now dealing with so much devastation and so much havoc. And they, they said, listen, we got to get this thing out of here. You got to get this ark out of here. So, so they said, now nah, we can't keep doing this. So they take the ark and try to get it out from Ashdod. And they take it to a place called Gath. And then they take it to this place called Gath. And when they get to Gath, the people at Gath, now they have to experience the same thing that the Philistines was experiencing in Ashdod. That they have so much recklessness and violence and spoil and hurt and pain. Now they say, hold up. You got to get this out of here. Because we don't want this coming on our people and our land. You got to get this out of here. So then they send it from God to a place called Ekron. And when they send it to Ekron, apparently, apparently the Ekronites have already heard what had happened in God. They already heard what happened in Ashdod. So they tell them, hey, don't bring that over here. Because we done already seen and heard what was happening to y'all. Read your Bible. It's in there to bless your life if you read it. Keep, 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 keep. He said, keep that where you had it. We don't want that devastation coming to our land. And so by the time you get to chapter 6, the Philistines are like, now how in the world can we get this ark back to the Israelites? We see that God is fighting for them. We see that God is still on their side. Now, now please don't miss it. Please don't miss it. Even when you experience a defeat, you still got the divine. Even when you're dealing with defeat, the divine still favors you. Lord have mercy. Listen, I wish I had about seven people in here who understand God doesn't just meet you on your mountains. For every mountain you brought me over, for every trial 
you seen me through. I need some people in here who understand that God is the God of the mountain, but he's also the God of the valley. And that's what happens. These people experience God working on their behalf, and even at a distance, he, he, he can take care of their enemies. But then by the time you get to chapter 6, Philistine, the Philistine said, let's get this out of here. Take it back to the Israelites. And they asked their priests, say, hey, what should we do? Well, nobody else take this. The story is out of what's happening, so we got to figure out what to do. And so their priest says, this is what you do. You get a guilt offering because you done messed up. Y'all done messed up. He said, you get a guilt offering and you take the Ark of the Covenant back to the people of God with that guilt offering and tell them, I'm sorry. Listen, I apologize. I ain't mean to do that. That's my commentary. Uh, but I'm sorry. I ain't mean to do that. I ain't going to do that no more. And now, now they move the ark back to a place called Kiriath Jirah. And that's where we pick up in verse 1 that they're having the ark returned to Kiriath Jirah. And, and, and it stays there for 20 years. And now the Israelites are trying to get themselves back together. They're trying to experience the presence of God on a whole nother level. They're trying to honor the Lord because they've been so busy dishonoring yeah, right. him. Right. And, and what you find out is that in the several verses of, head of chapter 7, uh, when Samuel begins to talk to the people, he says, listen here. What you've experienced is because of your dishonor, your disbelief. Because you disobeyed God. But here's what you need to do. Lord have mercy. Return to God. And when you return to God, God will begin to work everything together for your good. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I was wondering. I was going to get married, but a few of y'all caught it. I, I feel y'all got excited about that. Let me work a little hard and see if I get the rest of y'all. Samuel says... Don't think just because you messed up in chapter 4 that God is still angry with you in chapter 7. All you need to do is return to God and God will, is so much God that he will receive you when you return and he'll put you on a path towards restoration. Lord. All right, all right, all right. All right. Listen, may I suggest this Sunday morning that those of us who have strayed from God just need to engage in what is called consecration and rededication. If, you, if you've been here, you've heard the word consecration so many times, you probably get weary of people saying it over and over. But, but if we'll be honest, many of us, by our own volitions, we've slipped away from the plan and the purpose of God in ways that we don't want nobody else to know about. But we may as well be honest on this Sunday morning. But there's been some times when we strayed from God. We all have. Don't act like you ain't strayed from God. Don't act like you ain't done some stuff. You. There's been some times when we strayed from God. And as a matter of fact, don't even let the church crowd fool you. Because there's some folk in the church right now. Who this weekend straight away from God. There's somebody last night who strayed away from God. Is there anybody here who can testify? You, you come to church on Sunday morning just to repent for Saturday. Because you strayed away. It's all right. You can say amen. You and my friend, everybody done the same thing. These are folk who are coming back to God. They have engaged. They're engaging in consecration and rededication. And I like this. I like this. Old Sammy says, return to God. He says, you sin. You know you sin. God says, come on back home. I know you messed up. 
God said, I'm not the God that's so capricious that God shuts the door when you walk out on your own volitions. God keeps the door open and says, come on back home. And so he says, anybody here, how many of y'all heard the prodigal son story? Although the son went to a distant country, the father said, come on back home, son. And he ran to the son while he was coming back to him. He made sure that everything was going to be all right. And has anybody in here ever had to come back to God and say, God, I'm sorry. God, I messed up. God, please forgive me. I need somebody in here who knows good and well that God didn't walk away from you, but you walked away from God. But God said, my arms are still open. And if you return them to me, everything's going to be all right. Oh, I love a God like this. And so he tells them, listen, listen, this is what you need to do. You need to get rid of them idol gods you've been saved. But you, what you must understand, when the Philistines captured them, they began to mix their worship of the true and living God with the worship of the idol gods of the Philistines that they had been worshiping. If you read it, you'll find out that there were some gods of Aspereth and gods of Baal and gods, and they've been mixing them up into worship of the true living God. And in the theological circles, it's called syncretism. Secretism. It's when you mix up all kinds of theological and philosophical thoughts. When you put it all together and expect God is still supposed to be pleased. When, we, when, we, when you're giving God some half-time loving. And that's unacceptable, brothers and sisters. He said, no, 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 no. I'm giving you full-time fellowship. And you got to make sure that you prioritize me. He said, don't make me a second afterthought. Don't make me somebody you just pick up in case you need some help. I need about 10 or 12 people in here who understand that God must be first. He must be the Lord of all. Or he ain't Lord at all. He said, no, no, no. He said, I need you to come back to me. Return. That's what Samuel says. Return to God. Get rid of your idols. And listen. Why, wow, whoa, Lord have mercy. Before you come down too hard on the Israelites, I need to talk to some GEBites. Because if the truth be told, a whole lot of us in here got some idols every now and then. I know, I, I know, I know. You might not be serving the fertility goddess and all of this, but you may you may not be serving the idols of Baal, but, but there's somebody in here who knows that anything that takes more precedence than God has become your idol. Anything that you put more attention to than God, it has become your idol. Maybe it's your job that's become your idol. Maybe it's your house or that community in which you live and it's become your idol. Maybe it's your degree status because you got some degrees now and you somebody. Listen, maybe it's your title. Maybe it's your title that you got people calling you boss and now you think you all of that. That could be your idol. And now you're beginning to worship that instead of worshiping God. Listen, maybe, maybe it's you waking up in the morning trying to find out first what's on social media. Instead of talking to the sovereign master. Maybe you too busy taking selfies that you don't get to check with the Savior. Maybe you're your own idol. Maybe your children are your idol. Maybe your spouse is your idol. Maybe it's your boo, your bed, your boo thing is your idol. So it doesn't matter what you call it. If you spend more time with it than you do with God, it's your idol. And God says, 
says, listen, I ain't playing sloppy seconds to nobody. He says, I want to be the first in your life. And if you make me first in your life, listen, there, there ought to be some folks who can even say, I need to put away some things so I can make God a priority in my life. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added. Is anybody here to testify when you prioritize God, you'll, he'll hook you up with some stuff you've been seeking? So you run around here acting like you're trying to make all the money you can. And there ain't nothing wrong with money, but God said if you bring the tithe to the salt, Lord have mercy. So if you prioritize me, I'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. But anybody here can testify, God must be first. So worry about consecration. Somebody shout consecration. But it's also a word about rededication. Y'all say rededication. Samuel says, come back to God. And if you read verse 4, you'll find out this. They did it. Oh, that mercy. That feels flat. God, don't get it. Try that again. Try that again. He said, come back to God. Return to God. I know you messed up. God is a God of another chance. Come on back to God. That's verse 3. But in verse 4, it says, they did it. Oh, y'all get it. Y'all catching on. Y'all catching on. Samuel said, come back to God with your messed up self. He said, you've done so many things that you shouldn't have done, but God has given us some consecration and rededication. And verse 4 says, they did it. And, and I'm so grateful that these folk understood that the door was open for them to walk through. And listen, I came to tell somebody this morning, it doesn't matter what you did on yesterday. God said, come back here. The door is open. It doesn't matter what you did this morning before you even got to church. The door is open. Come on back in here. You, you can rededicate unto me. He says, you can rededicate unto me. And God will receive you. He'll hold you unto himself. And, and, and this blesses me in ways I never thought possible. It says, come on back. Come on back. Come on back. Come on back. You, you may have missed it, but come on back. I'm trying to move, I promise. But, but, but I, I'm just trying to convince somebody that you, you, you may, don't, don't think that you've done something so egregious that God won't take you back. Come on back. God, God says, come here. Yeah, I've been trying to work on myself because I just can't come in there because I've been doing this, that. Come on back. There's nothing that you've done that's so bad that God ain't standing there with outstretched arms saying, come on back. Listen, you got to come back to the Lord. Listen, that, all you got to do is come back. He will know my eyes and hold you to it. He says he's going to cast all of that stuff out. You just got to come back. I like this business of consecration and rededication, but can I push it? Because if I push it just a little bit further, it's not just a word about consecration and rededication, but, 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 more, but more, it's also a word about supplication and rejuvenation. Somebody say supplication. Somebody say rejuvenation. Here's what happens. They get to this place called Mizpah. M-I-Z-P-H, Mizpah. And when they get to Mizpah, that's when Samuel starts interceding for the people. And, and watch what happens, church. While he's interceding, the folks start fasting. They start fasting. It's right there in your Bible. While he's interceding, it's called supplication. They start fasting because they understand they needed something from the Lord that nobody else can provide. And I need you to hear me when I tell you that now that they're up on Mizpah, their enemies have found out 
where they are. Philistines have found out where they are and, and they know that they're getting restored. The Philistines know that they're getting restored and they're up there having a good time and the enemy now says that we want to advance on them and take them out. Yeah. Now, that don't make sense. You done defeated them once. Yeah. You done took the ark and the Lord was wearing you out yeah. for that. But then they're going to come right back and try to defeat them again. Right. So now, now the enemy is advancing. And so now they need some supplication and rejuvenation. Now supplication is a nice big word for prayer. That is, supplication is a nice big word for prayer. But it's an intense kind of prayer. A significant kind of prayer. Listen to the definition. It, 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 it says, you can take it down in your notes if you want to. But supplication is a form of prayer wherein the one who is praying humbly and earnestly asks God to provide something either for the one who's praying or on behalf of someone else. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Supplication. Somebody shout supplication. Supplication is a form of prayer wherein the one who is praying humbly and earnestly asks God for something, provides something either on behalf of another person or on behalf of themselves. And the text, in this text, Samuel, he's not praying for himself. He's praying for the children of Israel. He's praying for the children of Israel. Why? Because the enemy is on their way. And they're going to need some fortification in the midst of this experience to let them know they can handle it. Even though, watch this, they've been defeated before. Y'all lean in. Lean in. If your people are to fall asleep, nudge, nudge. Don't hit it too hard. Uh, they have been defeated. And because they've been defeated, fear sets in. Because they've experienced neglect and loss and lack, because they've experienced a frustrating reality, by the time you get to chapter 7, the Bible says they're so fretful that they're now nervous as to whether what they're going to, if it's going to be a favorable outcome. Now listen, don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. If you had some frustrating realities, if you had some frustrating realities in January, you, 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 you might get a little nervous about what may happen in June. And if things don't work out the way you planned it like you wanted to in certain situations in your life, you may, you may be wondering, do I even need to try this again? Will I get the same results? Uh, when the same results take place. Listen, as a matter of fact, there are some people in here who are worried about going back to school. Because you didn't pass that class last time. Worried about taking a test. Because you didn't go, it didn't go so well for you last time. There's somebody who's afraid about being recertified. Because last time you tried to get certified, it didn't go the way you thought it was going to go. And so they're up at Mispa, and while they're there, Samuel says, don't worry about praying for yourself. I got you. Oh, church, listen, listen. Everybody sitting in the pew today needs somebody in your life who says, don't worry about what you're going through right now. I got you. You need somebody you can depend on to pray for you when you can't find the words to pray for yourself. Don't fool yourself. I know you're spiritual. But sometimes life can knock the life out of you. And you don't know what to pray or how to pray. You don't even know whether to speak up or shut up. To move forward or move back or to stand still. Is there anybody who can testify, I need somebody to pray for me to intercede on my behalf? So I might not have a word. So Samuel. Started interceding for them. He engaged in supplication. And while he's engaged in supplication, they're fasting. They're turning their plates down because they want to hear from God. They need to hear from a supernatural power. There, there are some people in this room right now who 
have chosen to move away from the power that God can give you because you you got together. You 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 are trying to figure out and trying to find, trying to figure out which way to go. You didn't fast. You didn't do all of these things. But God has something in store for you. Stop telling yourself, I can't go without my favorite food. First time somebody tell you, hey, we're going to fast. Oh, I got to eat. All right, sir. I got to have this if I'm going to make it through the day. I got to have that cup of coffee in the morning. I, I just ain't going to make it. Stop telling yourself you have to you have to drink this, you have to eat that. Because you might just be making that your idol. Lord have mercy. God said, if you keep on doing that, he said, all right, I'll let you try that out. Keep leaning and depending on it if you want to. Tell him how that works out for you. So they're fasting. And while they're there, they find out that the enemy is advancing. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? The enemy trying to come at you while you're trying to get consecrated. Enemy trying to come at you while you're trying to get closer to God. As a matter of fact, there's some people in the room who can testify the month of May ain't been all that spiritual. That there's been some hellhounds on your track. There's been some demons trying to get after you. But this is what he said. Don't, don't, don't take it. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't, don't worry about what they're trying to do. Because Samuel says, I won't keep crying out to God for us. He said, don't, they, as a matter of fact, they told Samuel, don't stop praying for us. As a matter of fact, pray a little more intently. Pray a little more intensely. I want you to pray so that God will move on our behalf. And that's what it does, church. That's what it is. I gotta hear it. He prays more intensely. He prays intently. And then when you get to verse 9, it says, God answered. Y'all missed another shout key right there. God answered. Samuel started praying more intently. Start praying more intensely. Start praying more intentionally. Then verse 9 says, God answered. Listen, I don't know if you've ever seen God answer some prayers in your life before. I don't know if you ever had somebody to pray for you and God delivered just what you needed right when you needed most, but you ought to encourage somebody on your road and tell them he will answer. He will answer. The Bible says he answered, and when he answered, although the enemy was advancing, Samuel was praying. <clears throat> and while Samuel was praying, people were fasting. While Samuel was praying, People was fasting. While Samuel was praying, the people was fasting. Samuel was praying, the people were fasting. And while this is going on, the enemy was advancing. Praying, fasting, the fasting of the enemy. But God is working. God was working. Your Bible says that while they were still on this one, the enemy was advancing. It says God thundered a great thunder. Lord have mercy. I said God thundered a great thunder. God didn't hit nobody. God didn't strike anybody down. He just sent a thunder through the land. And the thunder unnerved the enemy so much so that the Bible says they were rerouted in front of the Israelites. Listen, Lord have mercy. The Israelites are up on this one. Samuel is praying. They're fasting. The enemy is advancing. God sent a thunder. It unnerved them. They got rerouted in front of the Israelites. And now the Israelites all of a sudden got enough strength. They got enough strength. They got enough energy. They got rejuvenated. They got enough energy within them that they were able to go and take out every last one of the enemy. And they slaughtered every one of them. So that none of them got the best of them. Lord have mercy. Listen, listen. I need, I need somebody here who can testify. I don't know how God does it. But some kind of way, God lets you see the enemy coming at you. And when he lets you see him coming at you, he'll take care of them and allow you to be the victor over your adversity. 
Lord have mercy, I need, I need some victorious warriors who may be in the building this morning, who can testify that every now and then that God does the supernatural, that God may send some thunder in the midst of whatever you have going on. And he'll reroute your enemy to where you can see them coming. And when you see them coming, listen, don't try to do it on your own. Allow God to continue to work. As a matter of fact, you ain't got to work tomorrow and cuss out your enemy or your co-worker. Just ask God for some fun. <laughs> Can you listen? You ain't got to stress over your medical exam any longer. Just ask God for some thunder. Listen, you, don't, don't, don't you trip over what you got to do at school on tomorrow. Listen, just ask God for some thunder. Can I find somebody who still knows that God will send some thunder in your life? He'll make a shaking and a rattling to take place. That nobody can withstand the thunder of God. And somebody needs to know that while you're on this one, Listen, he'll rejuvenate you while you're on this part. He'll give you the strength and the energy to get back to where you got to get to. As a matter of fact, while you're right here in GEP this morning, consider it your mystery. God is restoring unto you. He's rejuvenating you. He's giving you some energy so that you can go on a little bit longer, so that you can stand in the midst of your enemies, so that you can stand there and listen to the thunder that God is going to send down. And when he sends it down, it ought to remind you that no weapon formed against me shall prosper because I've got somebody who's praying for me. And because they've been praying for me, I'm able to stand firmly and take God at his word. I'm able to call on the name of the Lord and he'll step right in on time. As a matter of fact, some of us ought to pray for one another. You ought to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't know what you're going through. I don't even care, but I want to pray for you. The thunder comes rolling and moves the things out of your life. Trust in God and watch him take out your enemies. Watch him remove your adversities. Trust in God and watch him do the things that you can't do for yourself. But watch this. Watch this. Thus far. Thus far. They slaughtered their enemies. They took out their enemies. But after they took out their enemies, Samuel picked up the rock. The stone. Ebenezer. Said thus far. The Lord has helped us. It's the thus far that we need to be mindful of. Because I don't want you to think that because you was victorious, that you did it all by yourself. So I don't want you to think because we came out the victor, that you did it by your own strength and your own might. He said, thus far, the Lord has helped us. That means I didn't do it on my own. And if I'd have tried to do it on my own, I'd have failed. But thus far, the Lord has helped us. And then, this and I'm done. Thus far, lets me know that I've got to this place because of him. But thus far also has a future connotation to it. Because if he kept me thus far, it reminds me that I can still go a little bit further. Because if he kept me thus far, he's going to keep on keeping me each and every day of my life. Uh, 
thus far the Lord has helped us I know I know you get dizzy from defeat I know you get frustrated from defeat I know you don't even want to talk about your defeat but oh if you just Oh, 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 oh. 
for these that are coming. Pray intently. Pray intensely that God will move in the way that you want him to move. But not only that, it's good to have somebody praying for you. Sister McKinney wants to, we just talked about it, intercede for Keldrick. Amen. Amen. But the brave is coming, pray for himself. Amen. 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 The prayers of the righteous avail this much. And I know that there's no way possible that they can come and ask for prayer and we not pray with them and for them. We just talked about it. Pray one for another. So let's pray. God, we thank you for these who have come. Asking God that you would move upon their hearts, their minds, their lives, and those of their loved ones that they're calling by name. Father, we don't know what's needed. We don't even care. But what we do know, God, is if we just call upon your name, if we just focus on you, God, you'll do what needs to be done. And God, we're asking that you would do that right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that you would touch their hearts, their minds, their souls. Father, they may feel your presence and they may know and understand that whatever it is, God's got me. God's holding me. God's keeping them wherever they may be. God is moving in such a way that when I wake up in the morning and my feet touch the ground, I can shout from the bed and hallelujah, for God, you're still in control. God, have your own way. Like only you can. And we'll be ever so careful to give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I know that there's a simple way to do this. I understand that there's a simple way to do this. But whenever somebody wants to work in the church, we ought to, first of all, get excited. Whenever there's a young person that wants to work in the church, we ought to get extra This young man, you know, I put him to work, I have him do this, that, and the other, but he's already decided now where he wants to serve. And uh, you know what, that might be one. He wants to be an usher. And since William is coming, but uh, this this good brother here is about threefold here in the church. So I'm gonna let him go ahead and accept him because he's gonna have to help train him on the main portion side of the ushers. He says, well, you keep coming if you want to, amen. Amen. I think he about halfway to the job already. But uh, we're thankful unto God for when men, young men want to work. Ain't nobody man but the devil. Amen. 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 All right. Thank y'all so much. And I get excited about stuff like that. Amen. Amen. Y'all make sure y'all get them a shirt, too. Amen. Amen. Uh, all right. We are, uh, we are moving. We are moving uh, now to our tithe and our offering. Amen. If you need to be serviced by an usher, please raise your hand and they'll make sure you have that that you need. Amen. And while we're preparing for our tithe and our offering, those that are watching online, there are ways to give that you can uh, sow a seed into the greater of the church. For know that your seed sowing will not be in vain. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, let us not forget this afternoon at 3 p.m. Uh, we will be uh, coming back for our 100 women in red. So y'all uh, make sure you're back. Make sure you have your red on so we can have.
have a good time in the Lord this afternoon. Amen. I'm looking forward to it, and I can't wait to see what God is going to do. Amen. Uh, I'm excited, uh, happy that I've had my mama here for the last couple of days. Amen. Amen. It's, 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 it's an unfortunate reason why she had to come, but I'm thankful that she's here. She leaves out on today, so I'm praying traveling grace for her as she boards that plane back home. So uh, y'all pray with us so that uh, we make sure she makes it back safely, but I'm thankful that she is here on today. Amen. All right. All right, mushrooms ready in your hands. Amen. 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 Truly, we thank God. 
God for uh, such a worship experience. I can testify for myself that I've been here today. When Israel failed. Uh, matter of fact, I can uh, say that I'm in that state right now, feeling defeated. Uh, I, I'm not giving up. I, I still have my trust. In the Lord. Amen. And uh, this message today was truly meant for me. Amen. It, it touched me. It, oh, yeah. it, it let me know yeah. some things that I need to do. Oh, yeah. it, it let me know some of my faults and my failures. Yeah. And I really understand that. God has a plan oh, yeah. and a purpose yeah. for the Bread of Life Church. Right. Those, those members of the Bread of Life Church that are here, I want you to know that this word was for you also. Need to be some praying right. intensely, right. intentionally, right. and God will work in our faith. Right. I also want to, to say to Doctor Doctor Wright, my cousin, Amen. Thank you for. You're here. And to the Great Air Bethel Church, thank you for your help. Because when we reach out for him, uh, your pastor was there. Amen. 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 And he represented mightily on behalf of your church. So I say thank you. But remember, we we all need somebody praying for us. So I say to the Greater El Bethel Church, keep praying for myself and for the Bread of Life Church. Thank you, Dr. Wright, for being able to have these words. God bless you.
Father, use us that someone can see you through us as we go through this and the next week. Keep us as our prayer. Give us traveling grace that no hurt, harm, or danger will come upon us. Keep us until we return back here on today. In Jesus' name, amen.